Okay, so what do we know about the air we breathe? Well, it's primarily made up of nitrogen at 78%, oxygen at 21%, and then we have trace amounts of other gases. Now let's just take a quick look at how we've been growing cells in standard CO2 incubators. And as we can see, we culture them at 37 degrees Celsius to keep them at physiologically relevant temperatures. We grow them at 5% CO2 to maintain pH and at high humidity to slow evaporation of costly media. And to be fair, this has been working excellently for the last 70 to 80 years, and we've been able to culture almost any cell types uh, in systems like these. So just as a side note, we at Syntica do offer a standard cell incubator from RWD that can be used for this purpose. And just quickly, this system has been designed with simplicity and user functionality in mind, and it does an excellent job of growing and maintaining cells. It is important to note that incubators like the RWD one shown here are often used in conjunction with short-term hypoxia systems, and I will cover some of these towards the end of our talk. So what do we know about oxygen conditions within cell incubators? First, and I only mention this because I've seen this mistake in several publications, um, is CO2 incubators are not at 21% oxygen. So what are they at? Well, they are much closer to 18% as the partial pressure of CO2 at 5% and humidity between 70 and 90% mean there's actually less room for oxygen within these systems. So let's keep that 18% oxygen level within CO2 incubators in mind as we look at a few relevant definitions next. So there really are four terms uh, we should keep in mind as we talk about oxygen in a cellular context. First, we need to understand that when I refer to normoxia, what we are referring to is the air in which we breathe, uh, which is at about 21%. Now, what I need you to understand for this talk is when we refer to cellular oxygen, we really wanna get away from a human-centric way of thinking and move to a more cell-centric point of view. So what do I mean by this? So as an example, um, when we're referring to cell-centric in terms of oxygen microenvironments, what we can see is the air we breathe is at 21% oxygen. And the cells in the trachea are already down to about 19.7%. Once we move to the alveoli, we're now down to 14.5%, which is already 3% away from the 18% oxygen of a standard CO2 incubator. Further, uh, as we look at various cell types, we can see it only gets further and further from that 18% oxygen we see within standard CO2 incubators. So just quickly, back to our definitions. Quickly, just back to our definition. sorry. Uh, hypoxia in a cell-centric approach then, means oxygen levels are below standard growing conditions dependent on cell type. Alternatively, hyperoxia means oxygen conditions are above the standard microenvironment conditions. And physoxia refers to growing cells at oxygen levels that would be expected in the in vivo condition. So why bother with in vivo or in vitro oxygen levels at all? Well, first and foremost, there are several models and research fields that actually lend themselves directly, uh, directly to understanding how oxygen affects specific cell types. And this includes things like sleep apnea models, cancer cells, stroke models, reactive oxygen species, and so on. So while these models lend themselves directly to oxygen playing a role, I also think oxygen levels are important to almost all cell types. So again, here we can see that while the air we breathe is at 160 millimeters of mercury, or 21%, as we look at various cell types, they naturally grow at much lower levels. So what are the implications of growing most cell types at oxygen levels like 18% or 141 millimeters of mercury in a standard CO2 incubator? So I'm hopeful I got this point across earlier, but I'll say it again. Normoxia does not equal physoxia. And growing cells at higher oxygen levels is absolutely considered hyperoxic to cells. So the real question then is to consider how do cells see hypoxia, physoxia, and hyperoxia? And for this, we actually use the cell's natural oxygen sensor, the hypoxia inducible factor, or HIF for short. So very briefly here, um, what we're looking at is two separate uh, oxygen scenarios. The one on the left shows that in a high oxygen environment, HIF becomes labeled for and is degraded in the cytoplasm. 
Now, if we look at the right in a lower oxygen environment, HIF in this case is not degraded and is inevitably brought back into the, into the nucleus as an activator of transcription. So again, the question you may be asking yourself is, so what? So uh, here are a few of the many cellular systems that HIF drives the gene expression within. And as you can see, this includes things like matrix and barrier function, inflammation, increased oxygen delivery, angiogenesis, uh, anaerobic metabolism, cell proliferation, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So basically what I'm suggesting is the transcription factor affects a plethora of systems within a cell. And if you are not accounting for it, there's a good chance you could be missing something or are adding a completely unnecessary variable into your study. Also, since the cell is closer to the natural state, you're also now much better able to assess what may actually be happening in the in vivo state. Okay, so here I've chosen an example from a paper by Bort et al. in 2017, uh, and really it's just to make a couple points uh, before we move to the last section of this presentation. So first, the image that we're looking at here is the frequency graph of oxygen uh, in a partial pres pressure distribution uh, within the mouse cortex under physoxic and hypoxic conditions. And what you are seeing in the graph is the number of times under physoxia and hypoxia a given measurement was obtained. Hypoxic tissue, which is in red, uh, generally gives a reading between 8 and 18 millimeters of mercury. And physoxia, which is in black, gives a reading between 25 and 50. Now, what's also important to note uh, in this graph is it is overlaid with the general partial pressure of oxygen at which most in vitro research is performed. Um, and in this study, they state that's around 160 millimeters of mercury, which would be a benchtop reading. Of course, as I said earlier, uh, even within an incubator, it's at about 141. Now, there really is two important points I want you to take from this. The first point is, and I hope you understand this by now, and I've stated this a few times, is that growing cells far outside of physiologically relevant conditions adds a variable into any study that is often difficult to square as HIF affects so many cellular systems. And the second point is, and just as important, is as a researcher, you need to define what is hypoxic or physoxic to your specific cell type. And the reason I mention this is I oftentimes speak to researchers who have not done this due diligence and just want to grow their cells at something like 5% oxygen without knowing the relevance to their specific cell type. So it is certainly something you need to at least look up or perhaps even attempt to figure out before you start a new study. Okay, so this moves us perfectly into our last section of this presentation, which for me, uh, which is for me to try and help you as a researcher navigate this field of hypoxia physoxia and provide some ideas for you to think about. Now, regardless if this is something you are thinking about in the short or long term, you should at least come out of this knowing what types of questions to ask yourself and what type of equipment will be most applicable to your research needs. So onto this uh, roadmap into hypoxic and physoxic research, I really want to touch on three things. First, I want, to, I want to navigate the space. Uh, then I want to look at which options are going to be right for your research. And last, I want to quickly go over the options that Syntica itself offers. So how does one navigate the space? So my first tip is to look for industry leaders within the space. Now, there are a few companies that have been involved in oxygen sensing and hypoxia for decades now. And because of this, these companies have basically seen it all and they have well-designed and thought out products. We at Syntica have partnered with two such companies and they are gonna be the ones that I'm showing you today in Oxford Optronics and Baker Ruskin. Next, um, more focused on the individual products is look for features that are going to make your research more reproducible. So first and foremost, just choosing to work under physiologically relevant conditions is certainly an excellent step towards this, but to take this one step further, it is worth looking into systems that actually take measurements using partial pressures as opposed to percentages. And the reason for this is partial pressures are more precise day-to-day -day and location-to-location -location as they account for changes in atmospheric conditions. So just quickly as an example of this, if you had your cells in a chamber overnight 
and a large storm rolled in that changed the barometric pressure by 5%. Cells in a system that red, percent, that red percentage would be off by 5%, but cells using partial pressure will remain at the exact same oxygen condition with zero, with zero variability in the environmental conditions. So it's certainly worth thinking about. Next, uh, I always think it's important to look for features that are going to make your life easier uh, as a research lab. And here, what I'm talking about is things like, is there an easy way to get cells and equipment in and out of a system? Um, how often are sensors changed and can users do that themselves? Um, what, is a, what does a maintenance schedule look like for the equipment that you're buying, uh, et cetera? So last um, is to talk to an expert. And what I mean here is, I mean, I think it's a really good idea first to talk to your peers who use these systems. See what they like and what they dislike about their current systems. Beyond that, make sure the person, whomever, whomever you are talking to about a system directly, like myself, can help you navigate the challenges that you face and understands the system deeply as you may need their help from time to time. So the question begs, which option is right for you? Well, to be honest, of course, I cannot answer this for, for you as it fully depends on your needs. What I can do though, is make some suggestions about questions you can ask yourself as you go through what Syntica offers in the field. You should think about things like, is my study going to have cells under oxygen control for a few hours or a few weeks? Do I need to incubate cells and for how long? Do you need to work on cells directly under physoxic conditions? And what we're talking about here is uh, changing media, for example. Further, do you need specific measurements of cells? So things like oxygen measurements or microscopy come to mind. And probably the most important is what are your research goals and what will help you cross the finish line? Now, while you may not have given all that much thought to these questions, you should now be much better able to determine as we move forward, which options may be better for your research than others. Okay, so what I want to do now is I want to touch on four separate offer, four separate options, sorry, that we offer, and just walk you through a couple of videos uh, of some of these products, as this will give you a better feel for them. Uh, the four products that we will touch on are the Oxygenie, the Foxbox, the Condo Cell, and the Hypoxy Lab. Beyond that, we will delve a bit further into the Hypoxy Lab's add-ons to give you a better idea of all the functionalities that exist to a researcher. Okay. So the Oxygenie. So of course, the first option we offer is the Oxygenie. Uh, the Oxygenie brings researchers a small, portable, and continuous oxygen-controlled environment for short-term uh, physiological oxygen and temperature-based studies. Now, it's ideal for conducting high-resolution microscopy or irradiation under physiologically relevant oxygen conditions. The six culture wells, which are at the top left of the device on your screen here, fully facilitate completely enclosed physiological growth conditions. And these are seated on microscope glass, allowing for adaptation into pretty much any experimental procedure. So with a system like this, you can get results that are equivalent to research carried out in a much larger hypoxic incubator or workstation. And as long as you can get by with the uh, six samples at a time, it is a great option. Okay, so here we have a video that I'm just gonna run through quickly. Okay, so uh, this first bit here should just give you a better idea of the size and scale of the Oxygenie. And so what we can see here are uh, the actual wells themselves. So again, we need no incubator, no glove box. It's portable and continuous environment, and it's easily accessible for physoxia hypoxia studies. A couple more seconds, there we go. So here's the full view of it. So you can see we have two oxygen containers. Uh, at the bottom there, there is a touch screen that is easy to use and the wells. And so the wells themselves are on a heated platform and they provide whatever oxygen condition is fed to them. So actually, I'm just going to move just a slight bit more forward here to this time right here. So again, here's one of these wells. So again, they're perfect for radiation studies and high resolution microscopy. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is this uh, system uh, as Samir Patel, uh, who's on your screen here, is going to show. Um, when it is unplugged, the system will continue to run for up to two hours, meaning you can move your cells around to different locations if need be. And again, it is super portable and you can transport cultures from lab to lab. Okay, so on to our second option. Next, we have the Foxbox. And this is a dynamic oxygen and CO2 controlling system. 
Now, the system can be used on the lab bench, paralleling ambient temperature and humidity. Alternatively, and the way it is most commonly used, is within a standard CO2 incubator mirroring those conditions within. It is the perfect system for short-term experiments where media doesn't necessarily need to be frequently changed. Again, it is perfect for those looking to get into hypoxia physoxia without having to purchase, without having to, sorry, purchase a larger, more costly dynamic hypoxia chamber. Instead of just converting some of their, so instead what you can do is you can convert some of your functional CO2 incubator space into a physoxic environment. So just, just quickly, uh, it does come in two por portions, which is the gas mixer and the actual boxes themselves. And what I was just trying to show here is that one gas mixer can control up to three boxes uh, at one time, independently. Uh, beyond that, you have the option of a small and a large box uh, to fit your individual needs. Okay, so next we have the condo cell. Uh, this is a robust isolation box for any sensitive uh, cell culture in tea flasks, petri dishes, or multi-well plates. It fully captures the environment of any incubator or hypoxia workstation, making non-stop interrupted culture possible. So the condo cell, when used in conjunction with the workstation, uh, helps to avoid any disruption in temperature, humidity, uh, or gas to the culture microenvironment. The condo cell has the added benefit of preventing cross-contamination with other cultures in the chamber. So for researchers, continuous control over microenvironments in both culturing and observation mean that cells are never subjected to fluctuations in gas, temperature, and humidity. Again, I have a nice little video here just kind of demonstrating this for us. So I'm just going to kind of walk through this video as it plays. This is a little shorter than the last one. So the first thing I want you to take out of this video is just the size of these devices. So they are relatively small. Um, they offer continuous physoxia and hypoxia. They can be stacked. Um, again, they are a portable option. So you are able to take these out of your incubator and move them to wherever you need to. Because they have a glass top and bottom, you are able to do uh, high resolution imaging on uh, pretty much any standard microscope and their size allows them to basically fit within any incubator or workstation. So the last part here, I'm just gonna let play out and then I'm gonna give you just a quick description on how uh, I generally suggest researchers use a system like this. Perfect. I'm just gonna pause that and click that off. Perfect. So um, generally what I would suggest to a researcher is you would use the system within your uh, workstation. And when you were done working with your cells, you could take your cells out, you could use them on a microscope. From there, you can place your incubators uh, for long-term storage in a, a tri-gas incubator. And then when you need to work on them again, you can take your cells out of the incubator and work on them within um, a system uh, like the Hypoxy Lab. Okay, and this brings us right to our last product, which is the Hypoxy Lab. So this last option uh, is the most dynamic and advanced system, I believe, on the market today. Um, the Hypoxy Lab produces accurate, reproducible, and physiologically relevant cell environments for both short and long-term physoxic hypoxic studies. It is the only system that I am aware of that measures oxygen using partial pressures, meaning it's not only more accurate day-to-day, -day, but it also makes it easier to compare measurements taken uh, in vivo, which are oftentimes taken in partial pressures as well. Now, it's not a huge system, so it'll fit on nearly any benchtop, and its size also means that it doesn't use copious amounts of, of gas. Uh, it comes with an oversized HEPA filter, which scrubs the air within uh, completely uh, within 30 seconds of startup. And of course, I am a little bit biased, but as it is a system we offer, I do believe it is the most well thought out and dynamic system on the market today. Okay, so moving on to a couple of the add-ons for the system. Um, first, there is an internal microscope that can be added. That is the Cytosmart Lux 2. And what this is, is it's a compact inverted microscope for bright field live cell imaging in situ within the hypoxy lab. It supports single cell images, time-lapse videos, and even can provide confluency data. Uh, it supports imaging of cell division, monitoring of cell growth and confluence, uh, analysis of cell migration, wound healing, and scratch assays. Um, and as an aside, it can be basically used in uh, nearly any standard incubator, making it a dynamic research tool for remote imaging purposes. 
Now, next, while we already talked about the Condocell, I did want to quickly mention it here again as an add-on. For users who need more advanced microscopy, the Condocell allows researchers, of course, to take their cells out while keeping them at the hypoxia lab set conditions for upwards of 20 minutes to do this imaging. Again, it is a pretty inexpensive option for researchers to do imaging uh, and is oftentimes bundled with the system. So the last option we have is the Oxylite system. And the Oxylite oxygen monitoring system will provide a method to generate highly accurate measurements of dissolved oxygen directly from within cell cultures and media inside the hypoxy lab. And it does this via a miniature fiber optic, uh, fiber optic sensor that can be passed through the chamber uh, through a dedicated side gland. Measurements in the system are as easy as placing the media into, or sorry, placing the sensor into the media for a couple seconds. Now the sensor itself doesn't consume oxygen, which means it is highly accurate over time. Um, and the last point I really do want to make here is this system can be used in vivo as well for tissue oxygenation. And if you are interested in that application, uh, we are hosting another webinar tomorrow talking about tissue oxygenation and how to measure it with this system. Okay, so here's a, just a quick video of the hypoxy lab and some of the add-ons that I mentioned earlier. I'm going to jump about 10 seconds in here. Perfect. Okay, so here's the hypoxy lab. I just, again, wanted to give you an idea of the size of uh, the piece of equipment. So as you can see, there's arm ports that allow you to work within. Uh, it is a very, very easy system setup. Um, I've done it a few times, and it can be done oftentimes in less than half an hour. Um, again, it uses, it compensates for pressure in the atmosphere and it has a digital touchscreen, which again is very, very convenient and very easy to use. Uh, internal lighting. And this is the uh, transfer hatch, which is probably one of the easiest ways to get cells, media, anything else you need to get within and out. Very, very easy. Okay, so yes, and it also does continuous data logging. And then the last two parts it's going to mention here is it's going to look and quickly just show you that, yes, we can use the oxylite within it. And again, if you look at the top left here, you can actually see the sensor being placed into the media and the Cytosmart can do live, ce live cell and time-lapsed imaging. Okay. So um, with that, that's pretty much everything I wanted to talk about today. So just to quickly summarize, uh, we discussed CO2 incubators um, and how they've been used for 70 years to grow and maintain cells. Um, but they don't tell the whole story and are certainly not providing relevant oxygen microenvironments for researchers. Next, we looked at how HIFs are affecting a variety of cellular systems and if not considered, can certainly augment what one may expect to see in vivo. Last, we looked at various uh, systems that Syntica offers and provided some rationale for why, one, uh, for why you may choose one over another. Okay, so with that, uh, I very much want to thank you for watching this presentation today. Uh, I hope you found it educational and I hope it has allowed you to think a little bit more about your future research goals. I do have one quick poll question and then we're going to get to the Q&A session. So I'm just going to bring that up now. And the question that we have now is, would any of the options that we presented today, any of the hypoxia, physoxia options presented today, be helpful to your research? And the answers are yes, I would need more information or not at this time. And I'm just gonna take a quick drink and then we'll get into the Q&A. Okay, guys, thank you so much for answering that. Okay, so uh, I can see we have quite a few questions here, so I'm just gonna kind of dive right in. Um, looks like I have probably about uh, 10 minutes left and uh, yeah, we'll run through these questions and if there's any more, um, I'll answer them. So don't be hesitant to ask any more questions as we continue along. Um, so I do see a few questions uh, asking some very similar things about um, cell types and oxygen. So. Uh, honestly, without looking too much into this, um, uh, I wouldn't be able to provide an answer without really looking things up. 
But what I will say is um, I will be doing a Q and A in a few days. And what I'll include in that is a reference for all of you. Um, and what that's going to provide is it's going to be a super comprehensive review that looks at many, many cell types and tissues uh, and the conditions that they face in vivo. And if you're wondering now, want to look up the paper, it's by Keeley and Mann, K-E-E-L-Y and Mann, M-A-N-N, -N, uh, from 2019 in the Journal of uh, American Physiological Society is what it's in. So hopefully that helps a few of you guys. Um, okay, here's one. Uh, can the microscope shown be used in any hypoxia system? Um, so the answer here is maybe. Uh, most standard CO2 and trigas incubators, uh, you should have no problem as they oftentimes have dedicated ports. Um, but other workstations outside of the hypoxy lab would have to be looked into on an individual basis. So it kind of depends if we can get the power supply within and how that would work. But uh, yeah, so maybe on those. Um, is the oxylite sensor a Clark style electrode? So I will admit I'm not an expert on the oxylite, um, but I do know that it's not a Clark style electrode. And one of the major differences between this probe and the Clark style electrode is, from my understanding, uh, the Clark electrodes do consume oxygen as they take measurements. So if you're trying to get a reading in low oxygen media or tumor tissue, for example, it's probably pretty beneficial to keep the environment you are testing uh, unchanged if you can. Um, lung cells are similar. Sorry, guys, I'm just reading a couple more questions here. Um, what are the gases needed for a hypoxia system? So again, that depends on the system. Uh, and the systems that we looked at today need between one gas and three gases to function. Um, but at most, of course, three. Um, those three would be nitrogen to balance the oxygen levels downwards. Um, you would have a mixed gas of 20% oxygen and 80% nitrogen to balance the oxygen levels upwards. And then the last gas, of course, is uh, standard CO2. Um, can we place animals into any of the systems to simulate hypoxia? Um, so kind of two answers here. Um, first, I'll say you probably can put animals into any of the systems that I presented today, uh, but you'd have to run that past your animal ethics and care people. Um, and we'd also have to have a discussion about the application to make sure that's feasible. Um, second, and what's probably almost an always better option is we do have an animal hypoxia system that's available to us as well. So that is the Velox by Baker Ruskin. And that can fit one or two cages worth of rodents. Um, it has uh, really fast ramping speeds um, for those interested in doing uh, intermittent uh, hypoxia or sleep apnea research. Um, so yeah, that's probably where I'll leave that one. Uh, in cancer research, should we control uh, also pH via CO2? Uh, to parallel O2 or is it not necessary? Yes. So in cancer research, I, or in any research, I would generally say it's CO2 is still very, very important. Again, we want to be able to control that pH of whatever cell type we're looking at. So uh, in general, I would usually say controlling CO2 is going to be necessary, especially for growing cells long term. Um, so I have a question here. Um, is physoxia similar to normoxia in the lung? And again, as I was trying to explain uh, earlier in my talk, um, not necessarily. Um, so again, the air we breathe is at around, of course, uh, 21%. Uh, but the cells, uh, as you go further and further down into the lung, especially down to the alveoli level, uh, I believe I said that they were at about uh, 17%. So again, even with uh, some lung tissues, I would highly suggest that they should be probably growing around, you know, 17%. Um, those might be the only tissues that may work in a standard CO2 incubator. A um, couple more questions here. Um, how long would you suggest degassing media to get it to a specific set point? Um, so again, this question is highly variable and dependent on your research needs. Um, but I do have a few suggestions to degas media faster and more efficiently. Um, first, surface area does matter here. So the more contact the liquid you have um, is exposed to the lower oxygen environment, the better. So I oftentimes in this case suggest using T25 flasks for degassing uh, versus beakers or even worse, uh, Erlenmeyer flasks. Um, similarly, depth also plays a large role in the speed of degassing. 
Um, again, shallower is oftentimes better, and so therefore T25 flasks are great for this. And the last point I want to make is keeping the temperature lower. Um, and again, that may be uh, opposite of what a lot of people would think, but keeping the temperature lower uh, also speeds up degassing significantly. So even if you can't lower it down to like four degrees, if you just turn your incubator uh, down to uh, room air temperature, uh, instead of running it at 37, you will degas much, much quicker. And on that point, if you do need to know um, what level of oxygen your media is at, that's again where something like the OxyLite uh, sensor would be super helpful as you could just take a couple measurements at a few depths and make sure your media is at the levels that you need. Um, so I don't see any more questions. I'm going to give everybody maybe another minute to ask a, a question here. And if no more come in, um, then that'll probably be the end. Okay, no, no problem. So there's no more questions there, guys. I think what we'll do is I think we'll probably call the presentation here. Um, I want to thank you all again for um, coming out today and watching this presentation. Um, as mentioned at the start of this webinar, I will answer if there's any questions that come in after the fact, I'll make sure to answer those. And we'll also publish all of these uh, in a written transcript, writ written transcript, sorry, um, following up this session. Uh, further, please do feel free to reach out to us directly if you have questions about anything presented in the webinar today. Uh, last, thanks again, everyone, for showing up today. Uh, we look forward to seeing you uh, at a future Syntico uh, instrumentation event. Have a great day and have a great day. <laughs>